going to call to order the uh, Fayette County Board of Education work session on March 11th. And before we get started, I just want to take a, a moment of privilege and uh, congratulate Dr. Marchman's son, Andrew, for oh, achieving thanks. the rank of Eagle Scout. Yes, sir. That's quite an accomplishment. I know you must be proud, and please pass along our congratulations. Well, thank you so much. I was real pleased that Dr. Barrow was able to attend that, so thank you so much. Thanks. Um, are there any uh, changes to the agenda? No, sir. The agenda is uh, ready for your approval or submitted. Okay. Need a motion um, to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Fifth. The motion is approved. Well, now we're good to presentations, and I know we're uh, excited to hear from the, uh, the students at Whitewater. Absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, this is... Uh, something I've been looking forward to for quite a while. I've actually had the opportunity to hear this young uh, group of young people speak and I felt like it would be great to uh, have them come and actually present to the board and let you see some of the high quality work that's going on with our young people. Um, they're going to talk to us about a, a STEM bus and I won't steal any of their thunder but uh, this has really been a very collaborative effort. Uh, I think we started talking about this opportunity and Mr. Farmer, because of uh, it involving some technology applications, he, uh, uh, he started out, I think, uh, floating the idea to several different folks and we had a group at Whitewater High School that wanted to pick it up. So, uh, Mr. Farmer, I, I know Mr. Cole's back there and, and uh, uh, we uh, will certainly want to recognize him, but uh, why don't you come and introduce the group? and they're going to share some information with us. Thank you very much. Um, test one, two. Okay, it's working. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say this is kind of stem from um, about a year and a half ago at the Georgia Educational Technology Conference. The uh, keynote speaker in part of his presentation showed a, a big picture of an old bread truck that his dad had brought home one day and um, said that, you know, he, the dad brought everyone out and showed them their new camper. And the family, all the, the young kids were like, that's a bread truck, that is not a camper. And uh, he said, no, we're going to turn this into a camper. And so that became the family's project and they converted it into a camper. And so when we left the, the keynote speech, I ran into a few uh, Fayette County teachers in the hallway and they all said, Mr. Farmer, Mr. Farmer, we want to talk to you. And um, the idea started bouncing around about taking a van or a, uh, a bread truck and turning it into a mobile steam station. And I said, well, better yet, why don't we get a school bus that'll give us more room? And not having talked to Mr. Sanders or, or Miss Owen yet, I just thought I'll do my best to see if we can get a bus. And then uh, spoke with Mr. Sanders and Ms. Owen, and it was not just um, when would you like it, but it was how many, um, and which, was, which has just been fantastic. And then so we started bouncing around the ideas, and Matt Jackson, who's also here with our digital learning team, was part of that initial conversation. And we had some high school teachers, elementary teachers, middle school teachers, um, all very interested in this project. And as we took it a little further, um, Mr. Jackson got in touch with um, Ms. Clark and Ms. Mullen that have the STEM class at Whitewater High School. And I think since then we've also gotten uh, Mr. Starkey, the auto shop teacher uh, at Whitewater High involved. And then uh, Dr. Landman at Booth has also gotten involved because she's gotten uh, a grant from GOSA to help with the project as well. So it's really starting to spread and, and get lots of, of um, of our faculty, but the most important piece, in which you'll see in a few minutes here, um, is the students and what they've been able to do. Um, they've done a couple presentations already for some of us in the room, but we really wanted you guys all to to see it and to uh, kind of make this a little more public and really show what kind of progress has been made. It's been fantastic. So I wanted to thank Mr. Cole, and I think uh, Mr. Armour I was just saying he's been. Uh, involved with this as well and uh, Miss Wall is here as well from from Whitewater High School so it's been a, a really uh, fantastic group effort 
but it's because of these students that are seated right here. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to them. Uh, this is the Whitewater High uh, STEM class. So thank you very much. I think it went to sleep right as soon as I. All right. So uh, I would like to start out by uh, thanking Dr. Barrow for inviting us to come give our presentation. And I'd also like to thank the rest of the board for letting us have this opportunity to present to you our idea. Uh, I'd like to introduce my team. My name is Addison Moses. This is Kyra Barnett, Austin Britt, and Nicole Price. And sitting back here, we have our project manager, Joshua Johnston, and our secretary, Morgan Pettis. And I'll hand it off to Nicole. All right. Back in August, Mr. Farmer came and he gave us the opportunity to reinvent a space to interact with the community through the prospects of STEAM education. When we were given this opportunity, we decided to put it through the design process, which is how this entire presentation has been laid out, according to the design process. So the first step of the design process is to define the problem. So what is the problem? On your screens, you can see two quotes, one from the STEM imperative from the Smithsonian Science Education Center, and the other one from ACT.org. What they're saying in unison is that STEM jobs are high in demand but low in supply. There are many opportunities available in the STEM fields, but there are not many students who are qualified to go into these jobs. So how do we fix this? By repurposing a school bus to include interactive learning experiences, we hope to increase the longevity of interest in STEAM-related subjects. The next step of the design process is collecting information. Now over to Kyra with the interview process. So me and a team of three other students, Madeline Cochran, Mona Moore, and Leah Interkin, interviewed quite a few schools in the Fayette County area, ranging from Sarah Hart Minter to Birch Elementary. Beginning this interview process, we wanted to start off with the teachers. So we interviewed about seven teachers with questions such as, what would you like to do in your class that you cannot at this time? And a lot of these teachers wanted to make these activities that they had set for the children in their classrooms more fun and inviting and help them have a better time with what they're learning. And another question we did ask was, what was the hardest part of their curriculum? And although this is not part of their curriculum, most of them answered with time. They said that it, there's not enough time in the school day to fit as much stuff as they would like to. So we made sure to focus on these two uh, questions when we were creating the bus. Then we, then we asked the students. Uh, we interviewed over 100 students from the Fayette County area to get a wide variety of data, uh, ranging from kindergarten to fifth grade. And we asked them questions such as, where, where they were interested in. So we first asked them what they were not interested in, and that was such as rocks and fossils. We wanted to incorporate these into the bus because we wanted to mix something that they did not like and hopefully make it more fun so they would want to learn about it and retain more information. We also wanted to include stuff that they did like, such as roller coasters, gravity, and engineering. So we wanted to incorporate both of these aspects into the bus so that they hopefully can uh, can learn something about what they do not like and what they do like and blend them together and make a nice little bundle. On to the brainstorming and analyzing. All right, so for our, we, for our theme, we took everything that Kairos Group had found and we combined it into rock and rolling into the future. We took rockets, roller coasters, rock and roll, robotics, and rocks, and all, put them all into one steam bus. We want our bus to be kind of like a children's museum on wheels, a place where the kids feel free to create and become inspired. It will have different stations with different activities that the kids can go around to, a green screen where they can make fun educational music videos, uh, but most importantly, the students will have a choice of what activities they want to do, and those activities will all be based on the curriculum that they're already working on in the classroom. We also want it to be an individualized experience. Uh, all the activities will have a QR code on them that the kids can scan and receive videos and instructions on how to do that activity. We also want to use some kind of cloud-based device that can track what activities the students have scanned, and then the teachers and students can go back later and see what they've been doing on the bus. All right, 
The next step was developing solutions with Austin. So our next step in the design process was to start to develop our solutions and implement our ideas. In terms of the activities, to go with the rock and roll theme, two of our topics were rockets and roller coasters. We wanted to give the students the ability to construct and build rockets and roller coasters to teach them about like gravity and other forces. And all of these activities go along with the standards that they're already learning. With all of our activities, we want to, or with all of our topics, we want to also have virtual reality experiences for them to not only learn about them, but to also experience them. Two more of our topics were rocks and robots. For rocks, we wanted them to analyze, compare, and contrast different rocks and minerals. And for robots, we wanted them to learn about advanced technologies and coding through the use of robots. For example, the students could build a ramp or a roller coaster out of the activities or out of the materials provided. As we can see right here, we have demonstrated it with some of our students. Also, with our activities, we want to have lesson plans. So here is a template that has been made and that Josh has just handed out. This will bring together all of our pieces with the, them constructing and doing the activities and then the standards that we are bringing in and also bringing in an interest for STEM careers and occupations. In terms of how the bus will look, this is our idea for the exterior of it. Uh, it pulls in the uh, rock and roll theme through the overall stage-like appearance and the roller coaster through the middle and the rockets uh, as the roller coaster car and the rocks inside of the rockets. This is a digitized version of the last slide. Uh, this would be for uh, like a wrap to go on the bus. In terms of the interior of the bus, at the bottom, we have from the red and gray and black, that is our initial idea. And above that, we have a more developed idea. And above all of that, we have our color schemes that fit the rock and roll theme. Across the walls on our more developed idea are TV screens that will play advertisement-like videos to get the students excited about going into STEM careers. And it will be videos such as this. Civil engineering is everywhere. It's in every road you drive. It's in the clean water you drink. It's where you live, work, and play. It really is all around you. Civil engineers help improve the lives of millions of people every day. So we hope by playing these videos and doing the activities, that the kids will start to get excited and want to go into these STEM occupations. So on the left, we have a floor plan that's life size. That was after we went out and measured the inside of a bus. And over on the top, we have our most recent floor plan that is still very workable and that is still a work in progress. Below that is a picture of some of our students inside of the bus that we have. And it has all of the areas taped out with the heights. And here is a 3D type isometric version of the floor plan. Uh, from left to right, we can see the electronic storage where the VR goggles and the iPads would be, and then a teacher desk for the teacher to sit at and monitor the VR. Then would be seating for the activities, a counter where the students can stand, a booth for like more group-like team activities, and then a longer counter, and then the green screen space would be in the back. And then on the other side, we have the green screen space, the counter, the booth, another counter, and more storage for materials for the activities 
and then we have some VR spaces. For the amount of students that would be on the bus, there would be about 10 standing and 10 sitting for a total of 20. But we also have taken in consideration that some classes might be larger, so we want to have outside activities for them as well. And now to Nicole. Beyond, beyond the Whitewater STEM team, we plan on incorporating five other groups from Whitewater. Healthcare, auto shop, engineering, art, and technology, and teaching, pardon me. All five of these pathways are very important to the Whitewater community, and that's why we want to incorporate them into our big project. Healthcare would come in to ensure safety, doing projects such as making first aid kits. Auto shop would help with maintenance, ensuring that the bus is in top operating condition. And they have been helping us construct learning spaces. Engineering would come in to help with design, they are currently determining load requirements for wiring. Art would help with aesthetics, with painting and decorating the interior and exterior of the bus. We want this to be a very friendly environment for students to come and learn. And the teaching pathway would help with activities. The template that you have in front of you would be a rough guideline for the activities that they would come up with. As for availability, we envision for the bus to be available during the school year for elementary school students in Fayette County. Um, they would be available at the local elementary school and also at community events, such as Earth Day. We plan on them being accessed via reservation using Google Forms and Google Calendars, which we have had some experience with and we really like the way that that's laid out and our bus will be advertised as a self-guided STEAM learning experience for students. As for the sustainability of the bus, well, after the first cohort finishes their sophomore year, which includes the six of us and the rest of our peers, the future STEM classes and the STEM club will take on the opportunity um, maintaining and operating the bus. This includes working with the teachers, working with the five pathways that were aforementioned, keeping the bus the way that it needs to be for it to function um, at its maximum, maximum potential. This is our timeline. It starts back in August of last year and runs through December of this year. It begins with our proposal when Mr. Farmer gave us the idea initially. It works through our brainstorming, data collection, us selecting our theme, developing our presentation, our first presentation to Mr. Farmer and Mr. Jackson, our design boards where we went into some of the more intricate details, our official presentation, first at Whitewater, us acquiring the bus, dismantling the bus, seeking funding, beginning construction. The stage that we are in right now is the continuation of the construction. And the next step for us is going to be developing the activities themselves. Here we have a budget with Addison. Uh, so you can see this is our working budget. Uh, just keep in mind, it's very liable to change. Uh, right now we're looking at around $53,000 with our biggest breakdowns at technology, furnishing, and electrical. Uh, now we've already reached out to some industry workers, uh, such as a lady named Ms. Rakestraw with Verizon Wireless, and she really helped us uh, get up to date with some of the Wi-Fi connectivity and devices that we wanted to use. Uh, we also talked to Mr. Gould from Eaton Lighting. Uh, he came out, came out and talked to us about wiring and electrical and how all that would be set. Now, we really need your help. We need the support of the board to make our vision a reality. Uh, we really need help in a lot of these areas, just making connections with different people in different industries and getting the funding to make all of this happen. Uh, we especially need guidance in the uh, Wi-Fi logistics and security areas, uh, and also just uh, the flooring and really everything that will go into the bus. All right, do we have any questions?
Board members, I would like uh, to make just one comment. The, the, these are some of our 10th graders, and um, uh, the quality of work that they're doing, I, I think you can already see the reason why we wanted to share this with you. And we have examples of this kind of work happening probably in, uh, all over the system, uh, but uh, the design process, the engineering, uh, the research and design that they've done is, I, I thought, very, very strong. And certainly we want to, wanted to share uh, this work with you so that you could be up to speed and when people have questions. Um, I would say this, you know, you, you said your budget was apt to change. Uh, we deal with that issue a lot with the Board <laughs> of Education, so um, have great appreciation for that. Um, but I think that they have done an exceptional job in, in covering all the bases. But Please do ask them questions because they know this inside and out, and uh, I told them you might make them sweat a little bit. So if you've got questions, ask away, please. Um, well, I have a, I have a question um, and very impressive uh, presentation. Obviously, as the, the bus goes live and you start getting kind of real feedback on which activities are working and which aren't, are you sort of coming up with a feedback loop? to kind of look at sort of like how you may want to replace some activities with new ones because they're just, you know, not resonating with the students? Yes. Actually, we included the Google Forms. So afterwards, teachers can give us their feedback, and that's why we have the teaching pathway so that they can work with it, um, keep updating it, and do what really works best for the students. Also, we could get feedback from students uh, because they are the ones um, in the bus and they are the ones doing the project. So um, working with the students is also very important for us and keeping that constant feedback is what we are striving for. So we definitely are keeping that in mind. And that's also in mind in the design. Um, as you can see, there weren't many um, like set uh, things. Like um, there weren't, like. The, throughout the design of the bus, um, many things can change, like the curriculum can change, the uh, types of projects that go through the bus can change. So we wanted to make sure, we wanted to keep that in mind so that as the curriculum changes and as things evolve, um, we are able to evolve with it. I had a few questions. Um, one question was that um, about your vision for how to use this. Uh, is this just for Fayette County schools or do you envision going all over the metro area or maybe down to some counties where you might not have the resources we have? And what's, what's your vision for how this is used? Well, of course, we were first thinking about Fayette County. Um, we want to see how successful it is within our own county before we expand, but we definitely have considered expansion, moving it out to other counties, moving it out to places with lesser educational opportunities because the, the purpose for this bus is to essentially just share STEM, STEAM, education, science, passion for science, and so on and so forth. And we also, uh, going out to the schools would be our primary focus, but also we want to reach out to different community events, uh, like That's we mentioned good. the Earth Day, uh, some science fair, science engineering things that the community members can then have a chance to see what's going on with the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that you might not have thought about that I was thinking about <laughs> is uh, once you were, the, the acquiring the bus wasn't part of your budget and neither was the maintenance and the fuel and paying the driver and paying a teacher to, to be on the bus. And I was just wondering, um, have you thought about that or how you're going to address that? Or um, Yes, we've thought some about that, but that's definitely... <laughs> Starting that's, right now. <laughs> that's definitely one of the things that we're still working on, still thinking about. Um, the, the bus was actually given to us See, that impresses me the most that you talked this collection in to give you a bus already. So yeah. I think we should all give you a, a little clap for that. So so you got the bus, yes. Mr. Farmer and team, Mr. Cole maybe, you know, you guys you guys got the bus and they offered you multiple buses, yes. which is even yes. more impressive, yeah, uh, impressive on certain levels. Okay. Well, our hands are kind of busy. Yeah, we want to make sure we get one, one right bus. first. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Okay, the last question I had, unless you want to talk about that some more, is um, once you have this thing uh, designed and spec'd out, are you guys, is your class going to be the one to build it, or are you going to farm that out to somebody else too? Right. That'd be a cool project. Uh, well, we will be moving on from <laughs> the project after this year. 
but the STEM classes that are below us, the freshmen and then the new freshmen coming in, they will all have a chance to work on and do some construction on the roofs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, we are bringing in professionals, but we like for some of the stuff like wiring and stuff. It's pretty necessary to bring in professionals, but we'd also like um, some of the whitewater community to learn from it. So we um, have definitely thought about having asking the professionals if it's okay if some of our students come in and like learn from them and maybe help them out a little bit or just like you know get some teaching from that. So uh, yeah, in that sense. Interesting. The the bus itself. Already had the automotive mechanic classes actually doing some of that. When you saw the inside of the bus, all the seats have been removed, and you know those kinds of things there. So we already have some of our students that are actually doing some of the work. You know, so. I I like what you guys are doing. I you know one of the biggest things that you did is you step one when you define the problem. We don't often talk enough here about just how. I guess the lack of interest, right? At you know, I have an elementary and a middle schooler, and I know neither of them are interested in STEM, no matter how I try. Maybe something like this could could change that, so to speak. Um, do you guys see that as well? Like in when you were in middle school not too long ago, do you, do you feel like very few of your friends were really interested in STEAM or STEM-based careers? Yes, we've seen that throughout our elementary and middle school lives. So that's what we really want to aim for this bus. We want to connect the standards that they're learning and <coughs> weave it into a fun and interactive experience so they'll go out thinking, I learned about civil engineering today. I want to be that in the future. I want to impact the world in this certain way. That's what we really want to do is keep that interest going through middle or spark it so it keeps going through middle sure. school. And I remember when I was in the eighth grade and I applied for STEM and I told my friends about it. They were like, what? You know, what's the point of that? You know, you're not going to do STEM. You're going to do something else. Like, I don't think people really understand what STEM encompasses because it's all science, all technology, all engineering, all mathematics. Um, and just being involved in something like this has really helped me come a long way personally. And I think that the purpose for this is really just to reach out to those elementary schoolers because it only takes one experience to change your life. Um, and it only takes one person to influence you into what you want to do when you grow up, I remember. Um, my uncle was a firefighter, so I said, I'm going to be a firefighter. <laughs> um, I'm not. <laughs> but, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's just we want to impact these students' lives, like from a young age, because, you know, in elementary school, you're, you're like putty. You're so, influ you're so easily influenced then that um, it's, it's really the right time to get the, the impact in. You know what I would encourage you guys, I, th I think you mapped out, like I said, the problem. It's it's the biggest problem, and we do talk about it, just maybe not enough because it's that big of a problem. But one of the steps you left out, uh, to Barry's point on the budget, was think about when you're starting a new business or a new company, right? You have a new idea. Um, you know, Think of like when they started Facebook right, at, at Harvard and some of the various things that have happened. There's always that fundraising piece. I would just challenge you, while I suspect we're going to be – we're, we're definitely going to be talking about this. I would challenge you to look at outside of government, look at private sources where you guys can use your obviously considerable talent. You've got one, one or more buses already. Look at how you might be able to raise funds um, as part of this project. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, what it's what it's called and how the money would be received. Mr. Pol Mr. Cole could probably help, but I suspect. Locally, you may be able to raise a significant amount of money, more than you even think, um, for something like this. And, and you may be able to expand it, like Barry talked about, to go bigger than the initial idea of just our elementary schools. But anyway, I, I'm a big fan, and congratulations to all of you guys. You've done a fabulous job. Tenth grade, right? That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that we actually have for you is sponsorship how we go about getting one, um, what are all the requirements for us to do it. I think Morgan has some stuff written down from our secretary. Um, oh. Well, we were mainly just going to ask you about what we need to do to get sponsorships because we're not exactly sure if we just go up to them and ask them or if we have to go through a certain procedure and get paperwork filled out. So we want to know beforehand so we don't have to go back and redo it. Well, I guarantee if you find somebody that wants to write us a check, we'll figure out how to receive it. <laughs> we'll figure out how to take it. Yeah. <laughs> 
I would put a, pre a pitch book, a presentation together, kind of like you did, and show how they can be a part of it and benefit it. Maybe they get some positive PR publicity. Um, I suspect you'll find lots of people. Like, look, you named what? Eaton, you named Verizon. There's, a, there's probably many more that probably has those kind of funds that may be willing to throw it in. And obviously the board can play a role, but uh, I think you'll be surprised how much money's out there. Uh, one thing you can do is you can go to the um, Fayette County Chamber of Commerce website. They have a membership directory, and you can start uh, scrolling through the businesses and looking at the architect firms, um, TDK, um, firms that have a background with engineering or just community, and that can kind of give you a target list of um, people to ask. And they, some of those companies, Sony or whatever, they may have some, you know, Panasonic, they may have some grants available. Um, but like like Barry said, if you if you come across somebody who's willing to donate money, we'll we'll figure out a way to make it work. We'll <laughs> totally figure it um, out. <laughs> Roy, Roy. The, uh, first of all, great presentation. And uh, my grandson is in first grade, and the roller coasters and the rocks and the robotics. Yeah, he he's jumping all over that, and he'd be part of your program. Uh, these gentlemen are businessmen, and so they know what they're talking about from the businessman aspect. You're a kid. If you go ask somebody for money, they're going to give it to you. <laughs> no, go out with your principal or, or just a teacher. And, and as they suggested already, go to some of the businesses. And when you tell them it's for education and about education and you do the presentation and it's not the principal asking for the money, uh, that goes a long way. And, and there are a lot of businesses in Fayette County uh, that would contribute. And, so, you know, they've already mentioned quite a few. Uh, you can also go to the, the local Civitan and Kiwanis clubs. Uh, a lot of times they donated. You have a key club in school. Um, if you have a Civitan club in school, uh, you know, sometimes the, they're retired businessmen or businessmen that belong to those organizations, and they can help provide you with some money. But when it's the kids asking for something that they want to do, they tend to give money more than if it's an adult saying, please give me money. But that, that would help a lot. And also the sponsorship. Tell them you'll put their name on the bus. Yeah. That, you know, they're helping to sponsor what, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And the, the only other thing I had to mention, even though you mentioned you will be moving on, this will be part of the STEM club, right? So you'll still be involved in the STEM club. So you'll still be involved in it until you graduate. Not maybe as hands-on as the kids that are younger. but So would this then become a STEM club bus, or is it the STEM class bus, team bus, or, or you haven't thought about that? We've given some thought to it, and we we want it to stay in the STEM program, advertising it to students, because the STEM club isn't just exclusive to students in STEM, it's for all students who are interested in STEM, but we want the bus to maintain in the hands of our STEM program, even though the STEM club will have some some Saying what's happening, but yeah, mostly the Can I ask, as, as you research this idea and you define the problem, have you seen other districts around the state or the country that are doing something similar? Or? Yeah. Yes, we have. Um, Kennesaw did a bus. Yep, Kennesaw State College. DeKalb. DeKalb, yeah. DeKalb has a bus. Spalding. Spalding. Okay. There's a lot. Of Henry. The lot yes, of we've done a lot of research. Yeah, um, Georgia Tech has a bus, right? No, no. they. But we are working with Georgia Tech. <laughs> Uh, the Army has a bus that they send around the, count, uh, the country. Um. Board members, you may remember that uh, uh, this past year through uh, digital or uh, learning, we actually had the iSchool buses come. They've been here. Uh, we've had them go to multiple schools, and that sort of helped with the genesis of this idea. And, putting it out there. I, I can also say this. I know that uh, uh, with regard to uh, having sponsors come in, uh, I've worked with Ms. Gibbs, and she is working with some of our uh, key partners, and uh, they're coming to the table. They've actually been and heard one of the presentations. They've given feedback. Some of those ideas have been uh, taken by the students and incorporated into their presentation. Um, I, I would also want to mention to the board that the bus they received, these are uh, some of our surplus buses. Um, they're not any of the brand new ones y'all purchased, okay? Um, 
but uh, using some of our surplus buses that we would be selling anyhow. And uh, my guess is is that we're going to have some other uh, STEAM or STEM programs across the, across the district that are going to want to do something, and maybe they decide to make a healthcare science bus, or maybe they decide to make a fine arts bus. So there's a couple of different options coming down the road. Uh, but these guys are our pioneers, and um, I'm just uh, like a proud dad today. You guys have done exceptionally well, outstanding work. Yeah. Good job, guys. Yeah. Way to go. Congrats. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I think this is such a perfect example of having our students do real things. Um, I think too much of the time we just take up students' time with adult creative activities that don't lead anywhere, and this is, uh, I mean, the initiative you've shown to do something concrete that is going to help other people is pretty amazing. So thank you. And, and I just want to, um, if there's nothing else from the board. Uh, I, yeah. um, you do want to contact Travis Allen from iSchool Initiative because yeah. he is a former graduate of Whitewater High School, and they have a bus that they take around, and it, theirs is purely technology, but they have brought it to Fayette County. Matter of fact, it has been at Whitewater twice, mm -hmm. and students have gone out, worked in it, teachers have worked in it, but you might want to contact him for a sponsorship. They, they actually have an escape room bus, yeah. oh. so that's another theme you may want to think about. Yeah. Cool. Well, when we hear from employers, they always say that they're looking for people who can um, problem solve, work in a collaborative fashion under pressure, and be creative. And you guys have certainly have accomplished all that. So well done. Thank you. Great stuff. Mr. Cole, I see you over there smiling too. I know you're a proud dad. Would you like to say something about this group and, and your teachers too? I would love to. And I was going to come up and talk about Ms. Gibbs uh, offering her help because she has already sent out an email offering to meet with the teachers and the students about sponsorship with all of her connections in the, in the community as well. But uh, what a fabulous group of students. Um, they, have, they are very creative, as you can see. They do all this hard work. Um, and they're getting this, this thing going because one of the things each STEM group has to do is come up with the, with the research project. So coming up with a plan like this so that it carries on will help the, the future STEM program students as they come into the program as well, the STEM students. So I'm very proud of what they've done and uh, just a wonderful group. Um, the teacher advisors, uh, Ms. Mullen, Ms. Clark, uh, Mr. Armour, who just recently joined our team, have done a tremendous job of leading them. Um, it's been a collaborative effort on all of their parts. And Ms. Walls, who carries a tremendous load of making, making sure she gets schedules organized and everything else, but she offers all kinds of assistance with these, uh, with these wonderful students and the teachers as well. So all I do is get out of the way. I just try not to be the lid to their ideas. I make sure I'm, I'm open to the suggestions and the ideas and anything I can do to, to, to make it happen for them. That's what I'm here for them, to help and support them. Yeah. So I'm very proud of them. Board members, thank you. Congratulations. Now, I know you guys probably want to go back to school and get that last little bit of homework yes. done, right? <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, we'll move on to uh, item 3B with presentations. Um, Mr. Hollowell, if that's okay, and we've sure. got uh, a proposal um, that Mr. Sanders and our facilities department have been working with uh, Mr. Phil Mallon, and I think he's here with us today, and I uh, want to come out and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, proposal at North Fed Elementary. All right. Thank Thank you, Dr. Barrow. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. So we're not, we're not near as exciting as the, that group of students. Um, yeah, as Dr. Barrow said, about, actually about a year ago, I uh, received a call uh, from, uh, from Phil Mallon uh, with the county about some issues we're having out at uh, North Fed Elementary School, uh, primarily with um, cars in the car rider line uh, backing out onto to Kenwood Road. So we had some I uh, met uh, met Joe. This is Joe Robinson with the with the county. Uh, met Joe and Courtney out there as well as Phil, and just to, to brainstorm some ideas of, of what we could do uh, to to make it better. And uh, we uh, they looked at, at all the parameters we were working with. A couple of schools we flip flopped: car riders and bus riders. Uh, 
at this particular school that wouldn't work because of the size of the parking lot that we were dealing with. And uh, so they, they created several options uh, to present to us. Um, and, uh, and that's what uh, Joe is here today to, to present, uh, the, the option we came down to that we felt like was the best. It's a combination of, uh, of the county, uh, the, some improvements that they'll need to make on the roadway, and then as well as extending um, the, the car rider lane uh, to help us with that as well. So uh, I'll turn it over to Joe and let him explain uh, what he has. Thanks. Thank you. Um, First off, Phil expresses his apology for not being here today. He had an engagement with Georgia Department of Transportation in Atlanta. So he sings the second team. I am the transportation engineer for Fayette County. And as a professional civil engineer, looking at our future that was just here is really heartening. Uh, those are some very articulate and uh, intelligent young people that came up before. You should be proud of what you're producing here. All right, um, what we have, uh, this came to us as a SPLOS project. We had our residents driving down uh, Kenwood Road during school let out times in particular. And the parents picking up children were backing up into the road as part of this background, uh, you'll see, but that, um, I can't hardly read it, but it says that um, long range that you're growing with, uh, you know, by 2017, 500 and 754 kids there and 35% come to school by car every day, which is in the morning is not bad because it's a staggered time. But in the afternoon, uh, parents start coming in to pick up kids um, at the same time, which um, causes cars to back up all the way down um, Kenwood to the creek crossing. And that poses a problem on westbound uh, traffic that just does not go to the school and they have to get into the eastbound lanes and could possibly cause some problems. Um, so we got this included in the 2017 SPLOS and from what I understand it was not even on your radar as a school board or staff and um, when we approached staff they would say so what <laughs> we didn't know anything about it so and uh, we've taken uh, video up there where vehicles actually make u-turns up there through um, there's a dirt road up there, Thornton Lane, and um, it's, it can be a pretty dangerous situation that we're trying to alleviate right now. Uh, like Mike said, that we've gone through several. We had four options. Uh, we took these to the Transportation Committee. They looked at them and they kind of reasoned that they would like to see the option that has the largest storage capacity, meaning that as many cars can get on school property as possible. Um, and this is what we have right here. Um, it's basically a lane. It's a one lane going around to the east, and then it splits into two stacking lanes going back to the school drop-off area. Um, then we have all this right now on Kenwood there's a left turn lane into the subdivision a, um, a right turn lane into the subdivision to the south right turn lane into the school what we're proposing to do there is get rid of those right turn lanes and add left turn lanes for both the school buses on the left hand side of the drawing uh, left turn lane for parents to get into the school property and adding that left turn lane south into the Mercedes-Benz subdivision down through there. Uh, we feel that this will add storage capacity into the future for parents to be able to pick up and drop off their kids and not uh, have the safety problems out in Kenwood Road, which is 
our main interest is to make Kenwood safe for everyone. Uh, we've got, if what we envisioned the first stop was, was this would be just a paved road, but it's kind of morphed into curb and gutter um, on there. And if you go to the budget next page, the budget, it, it includes curb and gutter, but the, our consultant did not include catch basins, which have to go in as part of the curb and gutter. Uh, that's not included in that. Well, I guess it is since we bumped it up to 175,000. That's why the initial budget was 151,000, I believe. And uh, since we added some catch, since we know that there's going to be at least four catch basins needed to go into this project, that's why the costs went up. Um, and the county is expecting to pay 255,000 for the improvements to Kenwood Road. Uh, the total project cost would be 430000 um, I don't know if there's another uh, slide on that or not. If that's it, that's about all I would oh, just the, the schedule. Hey, can you talk about the advantage of the curb and uh, gutter rather than just paving it? Um, well, I think Mike Satterfield was talking about he wanted to see sidewalks. Um, I, I can I can answer that. Okay. So that's what we, we asked for. Okay. The the primary reason, Dr. Marshman, is if we, in our experience when we don't have the curb up there, uh, folks use it um, as a as a parking area when there's not parking right there. Drive out and uh, with all the rain that we've had, you can imagine the the muddy mess that we would have. Mm -hmm. Or even if they're just running off the side as they're they're pulling up in there. And every every other parking lot that we have throughout the system is is curbed. And that's that's the primary reason for that is just just to keep them off the out of the yard and, and creating a, a muddy mess. And I think that they have uh, axed the sidewalk part too because they didn't want to let let the kids get out early uh, instead of not driving them all the way down to the doors. So, um, but we're looking at uh, getting this approved and by the Board of Education, then we'll take it to um, the commissioners for their final approval also. Um, once you give your nod to it, we'll get our consultants to actually do a design on the thing, the civil designs. And um, when we was out there talking the first time, I believe that we talked about that this being so far away from school activities and um, students that this project could be built during school year school time and not affect school at all since it's so far away from the school um, but we'd like to if we get in summer construction this year I think this is an ambitious schedule uh, especially for um, plans I think we gave them two months and I think that's what our consultant says but I've been in the business a long time, and two months is a short time to turn around plans for anybody for anything you do. So, and then there's delays and stuff. So, I believe we can make a late summer schedule on this, and um, or midsummer. Hopefully, we can keep this schedule and get it done before school starts. But if school starts, it should not disrupt school at all. Um, Gladly answer questions if y'all have any. Buddy. Mike, I got a question. Bigger picture, it, obvi it seems like a need. I've experienced situations like that. How prevalent is that around the county at our other schools or other elementary schools? Very prevalent because of the number of car riders. I mean, um, I've seen it obviously at Booth. We've talked about that. Right, at right. Museum, but that one hopefully will take care of itself eventually. Um, but there, uh, again, it, it, the area like Inman is a good example of one where we have flip-flopped uh, the car rider and the bus rider, and that's, that has helped there because they can they can double stack them in there better. Uh, we did it at Crab Apple as well. Um, so anyway, at, at elementary schools particularly because of, of the number of car riders that you have, um, and those those parking lots generally aren't as large as as your high school parking lots. So, um, so they will back out. 
Out. Mm -hmm. It's just not, we don't have as many out on a main thoroughfare like we do up at North Fed on, on Kenwood. Yeah, like I could think of Kedron, but it's on a very quiet road. That's it's not right. that, even though it's a nuisance when you're trying Peachtree, to get by, right. it's, it's not the same right. as this on a major road with like the, the right. cameras are turning around. Peachtree City Elementary, and plus yeah. you also have, at those schools, you have golf carts that help alleviate sure. some of the, the cars. But you're right, they're not out on the main road. Where, where we're out on, on Kenwood's a main road that's a very busy road. And that, that was where they came from. And, and, and when, when he said it was not on our radar, it, it hadn't been brought to my attention. I, it, kind of like what you're saying, I knew it was there. But Mr. Sweat, when I talked with him about it, it is something that, that we have dealt with in the past with, with complaints about them coming out on the road, backing out on the road. And there, um, I've had ta uh, Ms. Uh, Moore look at it, and uh, you know, we'll have anywhere from 10 to, 10 to 20 back all the way back out on the road and that's why this this loop that we looked at I think was going to add about 48 is that uh, I think it's a little bit more, more than that yeah. um, we've looked at so many options I can't but if you were to add 48 even just 48 additional cars that would more than take care of what we're talking about backing out long even long term it's going to take care of the the issue we've had um, a couple of issues uh, or other situations where we've worked with the county. If you recall the Spring Hill Elementary, we actually opened that up and that helped a lot with regard to some of the uh, bad traffic that we were having That's there right. and trying to deal with people getting in and getting out. So um, it's it seems to be, um, uh, I know this is the first time the board has actually seen this uh, in the presentation form um, and um, uh, it's a partnership activity between us and the county. We're not having to do it all, um, but uh, we wanted you to see it. If there are questions uh, that come up after you've had a chance to look at this, please touch base with me or you can speak with Mr. Sanders. We'll make sure we get the answers for you. If, if you feel like this is something that's reasonable, I, I know it'll help make the traffic flow at North Fed much more safe for us. Uh, it's something that uh, we could put on the board agenda in March if that's something the board wants to do. Yeah, I mean, having seen it, it, it is an issue. And with the right turn lane into the, I mean, people do crazy, crazy yeah. things at that intersection. Um, I don't know, has having a SRO there helped at all with traffic? No, not with it backing up because they but get I mean, the queue out. But as far as being out there and, and assisting, yes, having the SRO has been tremendous, absolutely. But I, as far as it, the traffic backing up, there's not a whole lot you can do about that in the afternoon because they, they get yeah. there and wait well, and get I mean, the queue line. In, that line yeah. so in the mornings, she's helped tremendously as far as just keeping them moving, getting them, keeping them pulled up tight and those type things. That, that's where she's really been beneficial. Anybody else? All right, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Hollowell, we'll, with your permission, move on to item 3C. This is uh, securing excellent staff. I know Ms. Robertson is here. Uh, this is uh, our model of achievement and accountability item for this month. So, uh, Aaron, come on up and, and share just a little bit about what we're doing in HR. Good afternoon. I'm here to report on goal area three of our strategic plan, professional growth and human resources. And this is information that you hear every year. Specifically, I'm reporting on the following action step in our strategic plan. Ensure hiring protocol that is used with fidelity when filling vacancies. Specifically, we set a goal that 100% of our vacancies would be filled by June 1st. And the target when we initially set this goal in 2015 was 75%. Of course, the purpose of this action step is to fill our teacher vacancies as early as possible because we know that when our vacancies are filled early, we have a much deeper applicant pool from which to choose, and we're able to choose the very best teachers for our school system. Now, I always am careful to say that I realize that exceptional teachers are also hired in June and July. We do have great teachers who are hired later in the hiring season, but in general, our most talented applicants get hired early. The number of vacancies in April this past year was 144. 
which is high compared to previous years. Of those 144 vacancies on April 1st, 12 of those were still unfilled on June 1st. And there were other positions that became vacant throughout the summer that are not included in this 144 total, but I'll talk about those a little later. I do want to say that our administrators work very hard to fill their vacancies. Of the vacancies that we knew about on April 1st, 75 percent of them were filled by May 1st, so they were filled within a month. And at that time, we were still waiting on some of our new allotments to be approved. So it was, we were still a little iffy on staffing for the next year by May 1st. But by May 1st, 75% of the vacancies we knew about on April 1st were filled. And by June 1st, we had filled 94% of those. Now let's look at the positions that we added after April 1st. We added 87 additional vacancies between April 1st and May 1st. And there can be several reasons for that. Sometimes we have vacancies because there's an internal applicant that is chosen for a position and that creates another vacancy. For example, if an assistant principal is chosen for a principal position, then that creates an assistant principal vacancy, so sometimes that happens. Sometimes we have resignations or retirements that were decided late and we didn't know about them on April 1st, so then we fill those vacancies. And sometimes we just know that we need another staffing allotment, so we add an allotment somewhere and we need to fill that vacancies. So when considering all of the vacancies we knew about through May 1st, our fill rate by June 1st drops to 90%. So it's still at 90%, but it does drop when we consider those vacancies that happened between April 1st and May 1st. The positions that are posted in May are not, are not as easy to fill by June 1st, so that does result in a lower fill rate, but I think we still do a good job filling our positions. And what this shows us is the importance of knowing our staffing needs as early as possible, especially if it's in a critical needs area. Our total number of certified vacancies on June 1st, so the, the certified vacancies that still existed on June 1st was 41, which might seem like a lot, but you'll be glad to know that the total number of certified vacancies on the first day of school was one. So we had every certified position filled except one by the first day of school, and that one was a behavior support teacher in our Exceptional Children's Services program, and that is a very important position, but it's not one that's critical for the first day of school. So we did a great job filling our vacancies this year, even though we had more than usual. Any questions? Great work. No, no question but a comment. I know I talked with my colleagues all throughout Griffin, Risa, and other school districts, and they would be very envious of our <laughs> fill rate, uh, honestly, mm -hmm. and that's a credit to our principals, our HR staff, um, and I think because of the quality of system that we have. So, um, But it's important that we let the board know we are looking at this and we do have uh, 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 a real desire to make sure everything is settled with regard to our staffing at the beginning of every year. It, I mean, it is pretty man. I mean, you'll see all sorts of newspaper articles in August about how many hundreds of positions other school systems have open after school starts. So, yes, you know, great job. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, next on the uh, presentation agenda is our district radio system upgrade. I know. Uh, Mr. Sanders can come and um, answer any questions that you might have. This is a, uh, a topic we have addressed before uh, with the board. Uh, I think uh, maybe the last time you brought a number that was somewhere around 1.6, 1.7. Yes, sir. And uh, we've actually been able to saw that down to about 1.2. But uh, if the board will remember, this is the uh, – new radio system, the digital radio system that uh, hooks in with the county and, and the uh, 911 system. So Mike, uh, uh, share any other information we yes. left out. Yes, sir. Uh, well, it's just it's the, uh, the county's in the process of upgrading their entire infrastructure, you know, which is what we, all of our, our radios, our buses, our maintenance fleet, all of our county uh, admin radios, all of those tap off of the county's um, tower 
and so they are um, that the the infrastructure they have now is obsolete, and so they had put out a, a, a an RFP to to replace that, and and doing so that that in turn makes radios that we're u currently using obsolete uh, for the buses and uh, the maintenance fleet and that type of thing. So. Um, we uh, have been working with the company that was awarded the uh, the contract through the county, and as Dr. Barrow uh, said, we've uh, whittled away from 1.7 down to about 1.2, uh, just in uh, doing some things that taking care of some things ourselves, uh, like the um, uh, removing the current radios uh, out of the buses. We can do that internally. We have a staff that can do that. And the installation of them, that type of thing. We're, if we also, if we we take advantage of this, uh, they've extended the offer to us until the end of March, and the pricing includes a 30% discount uh, that we would lose after the the end of March. Um, and uh, and also, we're taking advantage by doing it this way. We're taking advantage. We're going to utilize some county personnel to program the radios, uh, which will help save us some money as well. So. We've uh, Scott Hyman. I'll give all the credit to Scott's worked really hard with this to to get the price down as low as he possibly could. So I feel like we're at a point now where where we're ready to to go ahead and and get once we get all of this installed, these radios will work on both systems. So we're going to be ready as soon as they flip the switch. We're ready, um, and uh, until that time, they'll still work on the system as it is. Mr. Sanders, one thing I know we uh, talked a little bit about, and I'm Mr. Rabel brought this issue up, and I, I think it's important. These are the uh, the 911 center radios. Yes. We do have some schools that have school-based radios that they right. use for administration, supervision, those kinds of things right. there. Uh, we certainly can take a look at that. Um, that can be rolled into. All, all of this is an East Blast expenditure because it falls up under our safety dollars. Uh, but we can look at those other radios as well. Uh, I don't know. We haven't done that by school at this point, but that's certainly something that we can address we can. Uh, moving forward. And Dr. Lombard and I had talked about that, uh, that we may be able to even take advantage of the uh, the $30,000 per school, that uh, safety the, the safety money yeah. that the state's, uh, state's going to hopefully give us. And, uh, Included in that, but we could also include it as a splice, e splice expenditure under school safety if we needed to. We, so. we haven't received that yet, board, but uh, we're hearing rumors that that may come to us as by the end of March. We'll certainly let you know when that comes in, but that hasn't been received yet. Certainly, we certainly do that. Any other questions, Tom? Yeah, I was just curious about how our pricing compared to the county pricing because you know and I know the 30% discount is probably there forever. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, second yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty. I mean, it's the same pricing, yeah. is um, is what they were they were giving. That's what we're we're tapping off of their their bid. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? If, if there are no other questions, board members, we'd like to go ahead and pull that over onto the uh, agenda for the March meeting. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bear. Good. Thank you. Yep. Last on our uh, presentation list um, is Ms. Jade Bolton and her staff. Uh, they're uh, at Flat Rock Middle School, and they're wanting to uh, uh, float an idea by uh, I think everyone is very, very familiar with the Community for Creativity that has started at Rising Star. Uh, it primarily wraps around uh, the fine arts area, uh, certainly not exclusively that, but that's the area of focus. And uh, Ms. Bolton has approached us with the idea about uh, pulling that into a STEAM pilot program, that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to let Ms. Bolton share with you what she's thinking and, and she and her staff are uh, looking at doing for this next year. Thank you, Dr. Barrow, and thank you to the board, those of you who are here to listen to our presentation. Um, as, a, as an administrator, we were challenged, so to speak, by um, our lead administration here, led by Dr. Barrow, to look at our schools and really think in terms of what is it that we're doing within our school that's making a difference and that's kind of a standout um, area. Um, and of course, putting some thought to this, 
our five-year journey in the world of STEM, and, and Whitewater High School did a beautiful job kind of setting the stage for our presentation today, so you, you have a lot of information on that. But we have been on a five-year journey with STEM within uh, Flat Rock Middle School, having started off with a class in seventh and eighth, uh, then going to a cohort in sixth, seventh, and eighth. And so what we're presenting to you today is a proposal now to have this dynamic experience, not just for a select group of students, but potentially for the whole school. So that's a little bit about uh, what we're going to share today. So I want to, uh, first of all, introduce the selected crew here. Uh, and of course, um, you guys know, of course, Mr. Charlie Harper, who is, uh, serves as our instructional coach. And then we have two of our STEM teachers who work in the seventh grade cohort, uh, Ms. Shelley Quantz and Mr. Natil Carby. And at the conclusion of our presentation, I thought it might be nice because I know you guys like to get as much information as you can from different perspectives. So we actually have two students here today, uh, thanks to their parents and grandmother who uh, offered to bring them, uh, who have experienced the STEM cohort for the last three years. And they are both eighth graders, Cerez Bousquet, and of course, Connor Lanneman. And if you have any questions, we've not told them what to say, so probably. <laughs> But any questions that you may have from a perspective of a student or even from a parent, uh, Ms. Bousquet is also here as well, uh, please feel free to ask that at the conclusion. Okay. Good afternoon. I really need to thank uh, Whitewater High School's team because they, like Ms. Bolton said, they, they set the stage. They really took care of my first slide. We, we wanted to start with why, what is our why? And uh, I was going to come up here and throw out some statistics to you about, you know, the, the, the need for STEM jobs, and that was their first slide. Uh, so the fact is that 76% that of our future jobs will require STEM proficiency. And I could talk about how many empty jobs there, there were uh, for every qualified STEM worker in 2010, 2016. The fact is uh, that trend is continuing. And we are going to have millions and millions of, of unfilled STEM jobs just because we don't have enough qualified workers for them. So that is our why. Uh, and it, I'm sure this is recorded, but I, I could rewind back to the, the Whitewater High School team when they were answering your, your uh, question about the exposure and how important that was to them. And, and your grandson, like they, he would be all about the the STEM, so that, that's our why. We want to create that for students. But I also want to mention that a few weeks ago I had the privilege of, of uh, taking a field trip with Miss Virginia Gibbs and Mr. Austin Saxon, who's one of our sixth grade STEM teachers. And we went up to Atlanta to, uh, by invitation to meet with the uh, American Council of Engineering Companies of Georgia. And they invited us there just to, you know, to pick our brains and and to say, like, what can we do? It was a really neat experience. I was sitting at a table. We three were sitting at the table with uh, these top executives from engineering companies around the state, and they wanted to ask us, like, what can we do, like, starting in kindergarten through 12th grade to get more STEM-filled workers because there's not enough of them. So, again, that, that is, is our why. And there is – they were concerned, because this is not just a national problem – it's specific to Georgia. You know, the local need and impact is, the fact is Georgia's, uh, you know, top four industries are agriculture, film, engineering, and, and automotive. And all of those require expertise or proficiency in STEM. Georgia's uh, home to powerhouse companies in STEM like Delta, Gulfstream, Lockheed Martin, Bluebird, Kia, uh, Heater Craft, Caterpillar, Coca-Cola. If you're curious about how Coca-Cola is a, a STEM company, I could launch into a STEAM lesson uh, right here. But uh, Georgia Pacific, I, I could go on and on. Uh, even in Fayette, we have Panasonic, TDK, Eaton, uh, Eaton, Shepherd Lighting. And these companies represent important industries, STEM industries. Aerospace, automotive, food and beverage, flooring, uh, fabricated metals, uh, electrical and appliance, machinery, heavy equipment. So again, we want to, uh, and by the way, a lot of these 
these industries and these companies, our students don't even realize, like, those are jobs. Those are potential jobs for them. And we want to start out with our middle schoolers. We want to expose uh, elementary students to STEM and STEAM, but our middle, middle schoolers, we want them developing those competencies and preparing them for when they get to high school to really choose those career pathways and be prepared. We want to build a pipeline uh, of STEM workers, qualified STEM workers. Go to the next slide. So why Flat Rock Middle School? We do have a large community of students with diverse needs, and I, would, I could argue that, that STEM and STEAM, it, it meets the diverse needs of all students. So our students need STEM and STEAM as much as the, the STEM career fields need them. So we, we like Ms. Bolton said, we started this, or they started it. I, <laughs> I, I just started at Flat Rock. Fortunately, it's a great place to be. But they started this journey years ago, and they've had great success with it. But uh, Mr. Carby is going to speak to that in just a minute. But when I got there, I was amazed. When I started at Flat Rock in January, I was amazed to find out that over half the student body is enrolled in the fine arts. So we we want to uh, transform the current STEM program to STEAM to to really focus on that art infusions and, and art integration. And I've been working with the Woodruff Art Center, you know, for several years doing that with our elementary school. So that's an exciting piece. But we already have lots of partnerships and support in place. We want to capitalize on that, leverage them. And, uh, and it's really exciting. You know, this conversation about STEM and STEAM is really exciting because it fits so well with uh, Sandy Creek High School's you know, pursuit of international baccalaureate, their IB program. And, and I've heard some people say like, oh, <clears throat> you know, you are looking at possibly doing STEAM, but they're doing IB. Well, it, it aligns perfectly. So with, before I turn it over to Mr. Carby, I just want to say that, um, oh yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? So I, I want to highlight the connection to standards, because at the end of the day, as teachers, like we have to teach the standards. That's our job. So what I love about STEAM is STEM and STEAM is that it's an amazing platform for, for making learning relevant and engaging. Like Mr. Pressburg said, a lot of times, you know, our learning is, is out of context. So this STEM makes it real. And, and that's what we want to do for students. Uh, the new science standards, the focus is on science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts and the core ideas. It's what's known as three-dimensional teaching and learning. So STEM is a great platform for that. We want to give the skills, the, the practices, the skills that they need. And that's not just in science. I hate that they're called science and engineering practices. Really, it's the same thing as in math. We have the standards of mathematical practice. And in social studies, we have the information process skills. And in literacy, it, it's those literacy skills of speaking, writing, listening, viewing. So you know that, that's the same. They, they have different names, but they're the same across the content areas. We want to give students those skills and those cross-cutting concepts, which are like cause and effect, stability and change, structure and function. So STEM is a great platform for that. And it also aligns well with the Georgia L4 initiative, which is literacy for learning, uh, literacy for learning, living, and leading. So we want to build STEM literacy. And Mr. Carby is going to tell you about our current program and where we're going from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, y'all. Uh, this is my third year. Uh, working in Fayette County Schools and uh, let me just say I've never had this opportunity to speak to the Board of Education so I'm gonna savor this moment okay <laughs> uh, uh, my wife and I we just bought our house here in December so I have a personal vested interest in seeing this program succeed, succeed. and uh, and that's all thanks to Ms. Bouc Ms. Bousquet so um, yes so anyway Mr. Harper talked about uh, why we need STEM I'm here to talk about uh, where we're at right now. What is our program looking at right now? Uh, Ms. Quance is going to talk about the vision for STEM, and then Ms. Bolton will talk to you about uh, what she's asking you guys to provide. 
So uh, right now, let's see if I can get it right. Okay. Uh, so so right now we have a cohort model. So in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we have um, a group of fifty to sixty students uh, who are in our STEAM program. Um, how they get in, it's an application process. We look at milestone scores, GPA, attendance, referral reports, all those kinds of things. And um, the reason and the benefit for them to apply for our STEAM program is because we do a lot of great things. We do uh, competitions. Our STEM students, they've won Griffin Risa math competitions. They've won Fayette County math competitions. Mr. Farmer was just bragging how uh, we dominated at the uh, student technology competition. So we already have a proven record of success for our uh, STEAM program. And um, not only do we do competitions, we also do field trips. We've been to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We've been to Plant Vogtel for a, a nuclear power plant. We've been to iFly, dealing with terminal velocity. So we, we, we offer a unique experience in our STEAM program uh, for, for our kids. So um, the feedback has always been positive. The feedback has always been great from both the student side and the parent side. But we don't want to make it just available for the 150 students because right now the perception is some students are missing out. So our vision is to extend all of that good stuff to the whole school. That's that's kind of where we're at right now. That's um, that's our vision is to extend that for the whole school. And uh, what? Yeah, uh, yeah, the next uh, next slide is fine with the current profile. Yes. So um, just to drive home the point, what you see on the left is the Flat Rock School demographics that we got from the uh, governor's office of student achievement. And what you see on the right side is the demographics of the students in our STEM program. So what we like to do is get alignment with both of those. And that's not what's happening right now. So what we envision is if we extend our STEM experience, the field trips, the guest speakers, the competition, if we extend that to all the kids and we have more of a representative population with our STEM program, we think we can do great things. So uh, right now you see there's, um, uh, there's uh, who is it, our Hispanic population. They are underrepresented in our STEM program. Uh, some of our white students are underrepresented in our STEM program. Even the boys are underrepresented in our STEM program. Two thirds of our STEM program are girls. So what we would like to do is really just e extend that success to everybody. And we don't want to leave anybody out. So, so um, that's kind of why I wanted to share that with you. And on the next slide, you'll see some of the data. Now. This is just the data from my students. So, you know, really this is just a reflection of how great of a teacher I am. <laughs> <laughs> but we can hope uh, that, that that same um, uh, level of achievement can extend to anybody who attends Flat Rock. And uh, like Mr. Harper was saying, it's going to align with Sandy Creek's IB program because I, ideally what we would like to do is have pathways established at Flat Rock and those pathways will mirror the pathways that are at Sandy Creek. But as you can see, um, statewide for uh, math achievement on the left is 514. So um, you know on the milestone is four levels. There's a, a basic, developing, proficient, and distinguished. So Right now, students in our STEM program are already outperform are already outperforming Fayette County students and state students in math and in language arts. So, uh, like I said, we we want to extend that winning streak to the whole school. So, so that's kind of what we're asking um, you all today. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question on how many uh, students you turn away? Because you, you said there was a cohort limit of 50. Yes, sir. So how many applicants do you guys have that don't get the chance to be a part of the program? Great question. And uh, Ms. Quance and I, we already had this discussion last week. So for seventh grade, on average, we would get 90 applicants. You know, So if we only admit the 50 
to 52. That's a whole lot of students that miss out on that opportunity. So um, really, for when we're going to open up the application for April, we are going to probably revise our application process. And for next year, we're going to extend it to 75 students. So, so we're already uh, moving in that right direction and, 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 and giving those students who are underrepresented in STEM the opportunity to participate. But eventually, we're going to just go away with the whole application. And if you come into Flat Rock, bottom line, this is the experience you will get. From me, Ms. Quantz, or whoever is your teacher, you're going to get it, you know, whether you like it or not. Because like the student at Whitewater said, everything we do in is really STEM. But what we have to do is just kind of rebrand our perception of what STEAM is and offer that experience to everybody. Um, I'm trying to remember what's on the next slide, if you don't mind, if you could. Uh, a STEAM vision. So um, like I said, the, the vision for STEAM, I'm going to turn that over to my uh, wonderful teammate, Ms. Kwan. Sure. All right. So uh, Mr. Carby will take that out because there's the advanced ed component. So uh, right now, the uh, I am kind of the STEM coordinator while I'm teaching classes. But uh, what, what I've noticed is each school does STEM differently, statewide, nationwide. So what I would like to do, because I'm a math teacher and language arts, but as a math teacher, sometimes I really need, you know, black and white. Give me the structure, right? Because it's so wide open right now. So advanced ed, they already have an advanced ed STEM model. So Fayette County already has a partnership with advanced ed. So what I propose to do is instead of us as a team trying to do it internally, we actually partner with an organization that does this kind of stuff already. They already have a framework in place. It's proven, it's successful. They have advanced ed STEM certified schools here in Georgia. And like Mr. Harper said, we visited um, several schools. Uh, there's Coleman Middle School in um, Gwinnett County that uh, we all visited previously. So what we advise to do is partner with advanced ed. They have um, 11 different standards. So in order for us to become certified, we have to show proficiency in all of those standards. And um, where we're at right now is we're already starting to uh, hit some of those standards. And um, uh, what we envision is during our summer uh, team planning, um, we're, we're going to meet up with the regional representative. I think his name is Scott Davidson. Uh, we're going to meet with him, and um, he, he's going to plan with our teachers so that we can do this effectively and efficiently and um, partner with someone who's legitimate and who's credible. And we feel like with this advanced ed STEAM certification, it will add legitimacy to our program. So, so that's kind of our vision right now. And um, now would be the time that I turn it over to my wonderful teammate. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us today. Good to see you all. So, Mr. Carby's absolutely right. You know, our overall vision at Flat Rock. Excuse me for the to podcast. The if you could just okay, there we go. Um, the overall vision at Flat Rock is to really expand and enhance the wonderful things that we are already doing, and that we have been doing. Um, just so you know, we do plan on aligning our program to the federal five year STEM strategic plan, and it really includes three main goals. Um, building foundations in STEM literacy, uh, providing students with the digital literacy skills they need, those computational thinking skills that they need to uh, go on and do great things at Sandy Creek and go out and, and be productive members of a STEM workforce. We want to increase the diversity, as Mr. Carby spoke to you a little bit about, within our program, um, and that is very, very important to us. Um, you hear all of the time, I'm sure you are all aware, that STEM professions are underrepresented with minorities and with females. And with our rich diversity at Flat Rock, we can absolutely change that. And um, we are changing it already when you look at the fact that most of our students are girls, most of our applicants are girls. Yeah, girl. 
girl power. Um, and all of this, of course, will you know just really prepare students for a STEM workforce in the future. So our goals um, of expanding the STEM program that we already have, um, we, like I said, our program has been extremely successful and we want every student at Flat Rock to experience that. We do typically have um, about 90 applicants, as Mr. Carby stated, and it is very difficult to turn away 40. And, you know, we hear, we hear from parents, you know, why, you know, why didn't my student get in? Can you take more students? And it's hard to say no, but because of the limitations we've had, um, that's you know what we have had to do. But no longer do we want to do that. We want to be able to eventually, over the next three years, um, make it an entire school-wide STEAM school. Um, and you know the question always comes up: Well, what about students who aren't necessarily interested in science, technology, engineering, and math? Well, that's where our A comes in, the arts. And we certainly aren't going to forget about the humanities, writing, speaking, um, history. They're all a part of STEM. Uh, and we are going to work collaborative, collaboratively together, um, teachers planning together. Um, it's going to look very different than it does now, but that's a great thing. And together, you know, we can make STEAM a reality <coughs> at Flat Rock. So currently at Flat Rock, um, we offer, um, you can see there on the slide, but broadcasting and video production. We have business computer science, um, chorus band, orchestra, visual arts. Um, we have a great learning extensions between our Science Olympiad, our robotics team that does an excellent job every year. And we have a collaboration program with the Woodruff Arts Center, but we want to, um, expand that and some of the offerings we would like to see going forward uh, are a career advancement um, position for students, music technology, and eventually we would love to have a dance theater um, drama program to incorporate the arts into what we're already doing. And with all of that, of course, we need the financial planning and that's where Mrs. Bolton comes in. Thank you. So our proposal here today is to be the second Center for Creativity School is where all of this is going. Uh, of course, we have also um, visited our current um, Center for Creativity, which is located at Rising Star Middle School, as you know. We've gone a few times. We have spoken to the principal and the coordinator that is there as well. Uh, we, we have done our homework um, and we feel like not only is this a great thing for kids, but we have parents and we have teachers that are very excited um, about the prospect. So in looking at uh, where the rubber meets the road, as we know, how and what do we need in terms of finances or what the type of planning. So as you've heard, we've looked at this being a three-year gradual transition. Um, obviously, we would have to have teachers that are trained because in order to teach in a STEAM cohort atmosphere, you're talking about interdisciplinary teaching. Uh, you're talking about what we used to say, those of us who've been in this game a long time, thematic units where you are selecting and guided by a, uh, a question and a lot of the projects and capstone projects and things that students are doing and producing are coordinated through the language arts, the social studies, the science, and the mathematics. So that is for a lot of us is referred as project-based learning. Um, and teachers would need to go through training throughout not only just incorporating it, but actually throughout the year in planning together as a cohort. So first of all, uh, we're looking at first those grants and things that are already available through the county and through the state. Um, also, we have had a one, we've had lots of wonderful conversations with Ms. Virginia Gibbs, as you know, uh, who is already um, working with us and determining 
potential partnerships, but also for the, a lot of those partnerships we already have, extending that even more so. And from those we've already spoken to, they are very excited. We haven't spoken to anyone yet who has either said no or given us a sign that they're not all in. We have had very positive responses from a lot of the partners that we have already spoken to. Also, we would like to establish an advisory council as well as part of this STEAM commitment with a board of directors that it's comprised of parents, uh, local STEAM industry leaders at, to fundraise and support the organizational needs of, uh, of the STEAM program. And finally, um, coordinating revenue re generating events as well um, through our self-sustaining and entrepreneurial student projects. Um, so a lot of those things um, our students participate in now, that's also a, a incorporating the business side of what STEAM is. And I, I love what um, uh, was said earlier um, regarding, I think the young lady from Whitewater High School said it, she talked about so many students do not know what STEAM or STEM is, and I will admit, I didn't until I actually got into education and started hearing the buzzword thinking, ah, I'm not good in science or math, that's certainly not something that I would be interested in. But now that I am a part of this work myself, there isn't much that you can touch on that is not integrated into the STEAM concepts, not much at all. So going to the next slide, we want to look at what is the immediate need to begin. So we have a lot of things already incorporated, as you've heard, uh, with our current staff and with a lot of what is being taught right now. As I've said, this is year five that we've incorporated uh, STEM within the school. But in moving forward, we obviously uh, know that there will be greater needs. Uh, the first one being a STEAM coordinator that would do this pretty much full time. This position goes into a little bit more detail. You, may, you mind going to the next slide, which goes into more detail about what it is. Um, one of the things I want to say in every and the research states this as well as every place we visited um, that has such a program that is specialized, there is this position that exists. There is nowhere where we've gone or spoken to that there is not someone that is attending to the STEAM needs. And with the prospect of broadening that, obviously there will be an increase in the need. Uh, there on that particular slide, it talks about what are the responsibilities that this position would have. Uh, obviously, coordinating and supporting the PBL training that would be ongoing, facilitating collaborative planning for not just the people within uh, Flat Rock, but also um, those elementary schools that we're looking to extend and also to the high school that we're looking to extend. We realize we're in the middle, but we want those two entities on each side of us to also be very aware of what we're doing and also be connected to those. Um, this person would also manage the budget, marketing, which is huge, and fundraising efforts for the school because you alluded to earlier, there, there is money out there and uh, we want to make sure that we're able to get a piece of that. Um, building the STEAM partners and continuing to, along with Ms. Gibbs, supporting us to build those relationships, bring those entities inside the walls of Flat Rock and also establishing opportunities for us to go out to them. Overseeing the student learning showcases. Now the showcases and the capstone projects is an element of what we have um, attached to the learning. And what will eventually happen within the end of the three years is that all of the students will be required to do a quarterly project. That's kind of a culminating activity of that nine week period known as a show, and they will display those projects in the showcase, and a showcase will be a regular activity at our school that will happen every nine weeks where students will be able to show uh, what they've created and what they've done, what, the, what artifact that they have created. And then finally, this position would act as a liaison, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with our feeder schools, but also with our district office, other entities colleges because that's another exciting piece. We've already had conversations with um, different programs who have relationships with the many colleges who have uh, colleges within their university that emphasize STEAM and STEM. So we most definitely want to connect to them 
they want to come into our schools. And we're really excited about that component because what we foresee is actually uh, educating our parents, uh, not just the students, but the parents about the potential of, st of STEAM and the prof uh, professions that uh, go along with that and the money that is available at a lot of these colleges and universities, particularly for uh, students that are under-identified for STEAM programs. Um, so middle school really is the more appropriate time to start talking about college to our kids, and we realize that. So we want to partner with these colleges to come in and educate our parents and our students about um, making sure that they are in the right types of classes and making that learning very relevant to our students. Would you go back to the other one? Yeah. Um, following the coordinate, no, no, back up. No, that's okay. Uh, and then finally, you will see some of the other needs that we've listed. Um, and I think that was, Ms. Quantz mentioned that about career or exploration position. This is also pretty typical. Uh, and this would be a connection class that would emphasize the different types of jobs and the needs and what's connected in terms of what, uh, what they learn and so forth and so on. Professional development is ongoing. Um, this is obviously something we would want to partner with our curriculum department here um, uh, in Fayette County to make sure that we have our teachers uh, amply prepared in the type of learning and integration, the marketing obviously, resources, and then of course the certification process, which once fully implemented, we feel will really be no problem when you look at those standards for the advanced ed STEM uh, certification. Okay, so that's kind of what we wanted to present. Um, I do have a little bit of a summarized uh, flyer that we're going to give you, but in the meantime, we are open to any questions. Now, I have a couple questions. Uh, first, you have currently you have criteria for the students to get into the STEM program. Um, yes, sir. Uh, we're looking at attendance, Georgia milestone scores, uh, their core um, core content um, level scores, behavioral reports, and um, teacher recommendation. Okay, and by expanding to the whole school, all those requirements go away. Yes, sir. Okay, in five years, the program has been in, in existence. Five years. Um, yes, sir. And, and um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And. You, you currently have about 10% of the population applying. Is that because only 10% qualify? We actually, have, we actually have more than that sometimes that apply. That, the 90 students they referred to earlier was just one grade level. So, oh, so one we grade have, level. we have applications for 6th, 7th, and 8th. We actually reach out to our feeder elementary schools to um, give information to the rising, well, to the rising 6th graders. So we have actually more than that that actually apply to be in our STEM cohort. And, and keep in mind, right now, currently, our STEM teams, as we refer to them, uh, are comprised of two teachers. So actually, it's two teachers who teach two subjects. That allows them um, a lot of flexibility in the schedule. So uh, a lot of these classes are doing, um, you know, more of a, hmm? uh, yeah, more of a block type schedule. Um, and um, so as we move forward, um, uh, right now, okay, so let me back up. So next year, we are um, looking at expanding that to uh, still our STEM team, but with three teachers, which will allow us to have more students that would apply. Uh, year two, we're looking at then having two teams, and then by year three, all three uh, of our teams, which we, are, we have three teams per grade level currently at Flat Rock. Okay. Have you met with the parents about becoming a STEM school? Or yeah. okay. Yes. Um, in fact, we did a. Um, um, we kind of started this process uh, last summer, uh, in getting input, um, and we do have input from uh, our STEM parents. I know that the teachers in our current STEM classes get feedback um, from t from the parents, um, and it's become um, kind of a. a, 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 a a hot item, let me just say that. Um, a lot of our parents really push 
um, and to have their student in our STEM cohort. And of course, the, the downside of that, as has already been shared, is we are not able to get everybody in the program. Um, but um, yes, parents have been engaged in the process. Our school council, uh, it was recently discussed there and um, PTO, and I can say this, um, I've not spoken to anyone that had anything negative <laughs> to say about it. In fact, it's been quite the opposite. Uh, parents are very excited about the prospect um, because this type of learning is very relevant for students. We also know, based on the type of learning through hands-on, relevant learning to real problems and issues that are happening in our community and in our state, that kids um, pay attention more. Uh, and not just, you know, particularly the gifted or the high students. It's really applicable to all students, even students who have um, difficulty learning at the same pace as others. When learning is hands-on and relevant, material and information, of course, is sustained uh, for those students more because it, it makes sense to more to students. Okay, and in your plan, you said first year, second year, third year. What year yes. is it you would need that STEAM coordinator? Uh, right away. <laughs> that would be the right one. Now without a coordinator. I'm sorry. I said you're doing it right now without a coordinator. Well, right? we actually hadn't, as Mr. Carvey stated, he's kind of been pseudo doing a lot of this, but keep in mind, um, it, it's it's been smaller. Uh, what we're doing now. It's not as um, inclusive of, on a bigger scale, what we would need. Uh, Mr. Carby spends a lot of time, I would say, doing this, and he is not compensated financially for that, as you know. I think it's more been uh, a passion. He's very passionate about STEAM, as is all of the teachers who actually currently work in that cohort. Um, and he does a lot of late night and weekends uh, working on this and reaching out to partners and getting information. Um, and, you know, I feel like if we really want to continue this, particularly at the pace we're talking about doing it, it's worthy of someone actually doing that position. And, again, that has a lot to do with the success of it in other programs that we have seen. So we do have the students here. And we have a parent. So think, again, if you'd like to ask from a different perspective, um, I, th I think Dr. Marchman had some questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I'm way behind, I guess, and uh, you need to catch me up. I've asked uh, some of the teachers at Rising Star the same question, but I was just thinking about my experience and uh, growing up in uh, Bibb County, going through the public school system, and I took physics and chemistry, and I was in jazz band, took calculus, engineering classes, and I was in. So, so, so I did STEAM, but we didn't call it STEAM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was um, somewhat prepared when I got to college, probably a little bit below average <laughs> in terms of being prepared. But um, I guess my question is, so from the 1980s to the 2010s, what changed? And the kids that aren't doing STEAM, mm -hmm. what are they doing? Because what you're describing sounds like what I would hope would just be a basic quality education for every kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what are the kids that aren't in STEAM getting? Well, they're getting quality education as well, but in a more traditional uh, format. Yeah, so probably. Talk about that, because what you're describing sounds to me like the traditional education that I went through. So mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's the difference between traditional and STEAM now? Well, what I might add is that you don't have interdisciplinary um, planning and learning. So what you have is students are learning math, they're learning the standards of English, science and social studies, and they're learning all of that, what they need to know. But what we tend to have in a more standard um, setting, regardless of what classroom you walk in, is that they're not so connected. So you are learning the standards and that's appropriate. But in a PBL type of atmosphere, uh, you are taking a concept or a guiding standard and question and you plan from integrating from that guiding question, and everything is about that. So I'll give you an example. As we have looked at um, some of the ones, um, what's the one that we? Um, PBL's project-based learning for. Uh, yeah, an example. Uh, an example of a project-based learning um, uh, standard, or something that has that they've worked on. Like water, water purification system. Okay. What, would that, what grade would that be? 
Okay. All right. So, um, as Mr. Harper said, okay, purification systems. So, so suppose we take a problem that is specific to Tyrone, which is where Flat Rocky is, um, regarding that that maybe um, Mayor Dale has has told us is a problem. Um, our teachers would consider that in the planning, and it's about a purification system. Um, how would the city of Tyrone um, uh, provide purification for, what is this, water? Or? Yeah, the pop, uh, the sufficient water for the population so that they can make microorganisms and mass, you know, all of the mass and balls and, and volume. Exactly. So you would take the problem. So it's the project-based learning component that makes the math, the physics, the chemistry to, into a STEM program? Yes. So you would take that particular problem, for example. The teachers would then plan from that question and integrate all of the components of their content. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the math would be directed to that. The science of that would be directed toward that. Even the humanities in dealing of the background, uh, the writing project, the, the writing assignments, all of that is generated toward that guiding question of a problem that is actually real. So five years ago when you weren't doing STEAM, you would say every class is kind of a standalone class and they weren't <clears throat> integrated. And, is that well, difference? that's still happening, yes. Right. So kids are learning, right. and it's, right. it's not that they're learning, you know, they're learning well. Uh, but again, the difference between a PBL setting and one that is not is that it's not necessarily integrated by a common theme. Well, can you have a PBL and not be STEAM or STEAM and not be PBL, or is that the same thing? You, I would imagine that you could. I would imagine that I'm just you could. To learn here, so, uh, yeah. Excuse my ignorance. <laughs> you probably could, but I think the benefit of of what we're trying to do is also educate. So it's not uh, necessarily the PBL that makes it STEAM, then. Well, that's part of it, but it's also the other part of educating our students on um, the vast areas uh, that incorporate that type of learning and the critical thinking that's required, the communicate, all of that things that we stress anyway. But it's making all of that very real. For, they have to do these kinds of things. In other words, we're kind of forcing them. Um, well, I wouldn't say forcing. Let me let me back up. I think that they they like that kind of learning, and it makes it more relevant to what they're doing. Does that make sense? Well, it's also teaching a, a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I guess I don't understand why um, we need to spend another. Uh, almost two hundred thousand dollars to do what you're kind of already doing anyway. That, that's the part that I'm kind of where I got the. Disconnect. Well, what we're doing right now, remember, is only for a limited amount of students. Mm -hmm. So what we're proposing is that uh, we're moving in the direction with all of our students, which is making, um, which is teaching in a uh, interdisciplinary manner with all students, but also connected to that, um, the uh, projects, the partners. Uh, the experiences, um, uh, which is a, which is a little bit different, having those partners come into the school uh, as well. They're speaking. They're also a part of the projects that the students are doing because they're also bringing the problems that they're having and experiencing in in their particular area. The, um, I had a question. Yeah, if I, a question, and this may be for the the the, the students. Um, would you say the level of engagement um, is higher in a project-based learning environment rather than sort of the, um, you know, sitting in the class mm -hmm. and just having the information presented to you? <laughs> Connor, you want to come up? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is more engaging because instead of just having information at you, you're doing things, you're applying the information to your standards and other things so you can learn it all at once. Thank you. Can I ask you one more question? Do you mind? Yeah. It'll be an easy one, I promise. <laughs> so thinking about uh, the STEM, STEAM classes you have now, d is this your first year or second year? Because you were in seventh grade? Uh, I'm an eighth grader, eighth grade? so I've been through STEM all middle school. All three years, okay. So. Is it fair to say it's night and day, the experience? I mean, in the STEAM curriculum, like doing these projects and tackling problems, and it's, I don't, I, I, I've been trying to understand it for years, like Dr. Marchman's asked, 
is it the hands-on element that really makes it kind of fit for you and connect? What what is it about it that you love? If you had to, if you had to put it into words, I would say that it's different from elementary school and that it's more engaging. And yes, the hands-on part does make it what it is. Okay. No, oh, thank you very much. Yep. I did want to chime in because um, I do believe that good good teaching is good teaching, right? Um, regardless, but um, I do think the focus on the career aspect um, is kind of uh, what we're losing sight of. Because if Sandy Creek has all these pathways for computer science, well, at the middle school level, how many of our teachers are familiar with computer science? Okay, so with the STEAM principle, what we can do is provide staff development on how we can incorporate computer science in science in technology in your math courses in your social studies courses so what the whole purpose of this is is just to kind of reframe what steam is and particularly since we have pinewood studios here in fayette you know sandy creek does have a um film and design pathway all right, so at the middle school level, maybe teachers can do more projects using the green screen and get students and get students more familiar with video production, soundtrack production. So that's kind of what I want to put in your ear is uh, good teaching is good teaching. Yes, this isn't a waste of money. No, uh, but it, it's designed to help kids be more career ready. And right now, some some teachers kind of do it um, in isolation, and that's the negative side, right? Because we want to go school wide with this. So regardless if they have me or Ms. Quantz or whoever, whoever their teacher is, they're going to get exposure to film and media production, audio production, animation. They're going to get that kind of exposure, whoever their teacher is. So that's kind of um, hopefully I clarified yep. something. Thank you, yeah. Leonard. Do you have anything? Are there any other uh, questions? I think I think Ms. Bousquet, excuse me, I'm part, sorry, and our parent wanted to say something. Is that okay? Uh, sure. Absolutely. I'm sorry, but uh, Connor actually uh, touched up upon this, but um, the project-based learning. Uh, I've, I have a uh, a son who graduated from Sandy Creek. Uh, he went through Flat Rock Middle. He did not have the STEM curricular uh, curriculum that my daughter has been privileged to have for the last three years. So the project-based learning that she is doing, um, she is so much more engaged um, with her classes. Uh, her, uh, everything that she's learning, it seems more relevant to her, like to real life as where my son sat in class and just had everything taught to him and really wasn't that engaged in, and interested. Now, Cerez, she's been always been the artsy kind of girl, so she has never been um, like a, a real science-oriented um, student. And now that she's gone through the three uh, years of STEM, she has won the um, uh, the regional competition, the tech competition for animation. Uh, she is very versed in computer science, doing arts, and where it used to be just you know like drawing, now it's completely tech based, and it just blows me away. And everything that she's learning, including the standards, is completely relevant to her. I think she is a lot more prepared for high school, college, and the real world than my son was, frankly, by not going through this. Well, well, Daphne, that's some advanced level parenting because you made a great point and embarrassed your daughter at the same time. <laughs> well, Dr. Barrett, my point was, um, if we know kids learn better this way, and we know that it works, and we know kids are more engaged, not bored at school, why are only 90 kids getting to do this, or 50 kids getting to do this out of, out of the population? And uh, that's really my, my big concern. Countywide, not yeah, just. Yeah, yeah. Not just. And, and that's my big concern. We've known that kids learn this way for quite a while, 
why have we not taken advantage of that knowledge much, much sooner than today? And what are we doing with the kids that aren't able to learn this way? And how much of a disadvantage are they at um, compared to the kids that get to participate in this type of education? So. Is that? No, that's not directed no, no, to me. Is it? Oh, okay. sure. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> you're good. I didn't know. If you, I think okay. that's part of a um, a larger evolutionary question that we're trying to answer within our district. We have been very, very successful at traditional practices, and it's been hard to shift away from that uh, to look at a more relevant, integrated practice. And that's what these folks are asking to be able to do. Um, it's not that the practice that we've had is bad, it's just that we know that we can do better. And that's what we're trying to do with these early initiators and beginning to move in that direction. And we'll be talking more about this, I, I don't mind sharing with the board uh, in our retreat, and be able to give you some rationale and hopefully some future steps to give us that growth mindset throughout the district. So I'm, I don't, I'm, it, it, it's part of a bigger a bigger shift that we're making across the district. Dr. Brown, can I ask you one add-on question? So thinking back to the discussion about helping the students that aren't achieving, you know, standards at, at the various schools that we had, we had talked about, have we, do we have any data that this kind of, we'll call it project-based learning, is delivering superior results to traditional classroom learning that we could possibly make a difference in, in those schools by a shift in strategy, you know, teaching strategy? Or, and I know it's not something you have to answer now, but maybe something we could talk sure. about later. I'd, we'd be happy to talk about okay. that. I, I can point to a lot of the, uh, the work that's been done this year at Rising Star and say absolutely. Uh, it's showing great gains there. Um, I think um, the data that was shared uh, with what the STEM cohort has done in comparison to the rest of the state, I think that's um, um, if not, if nothing else, at, l at least qualitative, we can point to the what's happened and in, in they're performing higher than. Now we recognize that these are hand-picked students as well by the application process, so I'm not, I'm notwithstanding, I know you're a great teacher, <laughs> but uh, you know, what we hope to be able to do is have that proof of concept sure. and be able to do that. I can tell you that the integrated approaches where kids are more engaged with their learning proves to be much more successful with regard to their outputs in, okay. their, in their scores. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be having more conversations, Ms. Bolton, but thank you, and thank you for the team, parents, and students uh, for being here today and presenting for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, superintendent's report. Yes, sir. We're going to speed this process up just a little bit. I know Mr. Satterfield's sitting out in the audience, so we'll look at facilities updates. I can tell you, I know you've already read through that. The one thing I do want to comment on is that the um, expansion at uh, McIntosh High School actually had a chance to walk through there uh, last Friday, and um, we're very excited. Mike tells us that we're on um, on timeline, probably going to finish sometime maybe the end of May, and we'll have plenty of time to actually be able to move into that facility and be able to start in the fall. So unless you have any questions about the facility, uh, I'll move on to the um, attendance and enrollment report. Um, the report that you have is actually February 22nd. As we did a 20-period uh, calendar month day. Uh, we were at 20,312. I actually pulled the data for today, and we're uh, at 20,332 students. So we're up even a few more. So roughly over 200 students, 214 students more than we were this time last year. So we're excited to see that, uh, that bump up in growth. Um, any questions about attendance? If none, I'll move on to item C. Looking at the school calendar preparation, we talked about this at our last meeting. I can report that Mr. Sweat and Dr. Turner have already been meeting. They've uh, formulated uh, a calendar committee. We're going to have um, our teachers of the year. Uh, some of them will have parents, we'll have a student, student representatives, we'll have staff uh, from the building level, and we'll have staff from the central office level. It's going to be a little larger committee. Uh, but we feel like we need to have that. That committee will gather data and feedback on the potential uh, calendars for the next two years. 
and um, uh, we'll see how fast that work goes. Uh, ultimately, they'll be bringing us some recommendations back uh, from the committee. Um, any comments or questions about the calendar itself? Yes, sir. If none, I'll move on to item D. Uh, this is actually for the board, um, and I know that uh, we've pushed out the uh, board self-assessment. Uh, wanted to make sure if, uh, we were making progress there. Um, if you have any needs or need any help with that, certainly we want to help. But I know we also wanted to submit some names for a community review. Um, and I don't know if uh, y'all have had a chance to get those names together. I'll be quiet. Work, work, working on it. Working on that. I've okay. got. Do you want me to, you. Scott? Do you want me to submit them to you or to Kay or for the um, name? Um, maybe both. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll get on that. That'll yeah. work. Okay. Great. Uh, as soon as we can get that together and, and complete the uh, self-assessment survey, uh, we'll be able to put that in the aggregate. I know Kay's going to push that back out to you as soon as it's done. And uh, we're excited about the opportunity to sit down with the board and, and take a look. Um, hey, um, what's the time frame for the self-assessment? Like far back, because we talked about this last year, and some of us answered the questions in terms of you know, ancient history to now. Sure. And some of us might have answered the questions in the previous year. And so uh, I think we need to uh, agree on how we're answering the questions. I, I, I kind of did it for the, um, you know, last year up to now. So I did like the last 12, 13 months. Okay. I mean, that was, you know, I mean, since we did one last year. And Mr. Raybo, you can do it for your time. I mean, that, that's all. I submitted mine. It's just two months. There you go. There we go. 30 pages long. There we go. Um, but if there's anything we can do to help with that, certainly we want to facilitate that, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to getting that. I, I do know that the application itself is due, I think, April 15th uh, for the board exemplary process. So uh, we've got some time, but we need to need to go ahead and button this thing up uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments about the board self-assessment, uh, the stagecoach property closing uh, sent the uh, board that information last week. We're, we're pleased to uh, 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 let you know that the, that 37 plus acres is, is now uh, property of the Fayette County Board of Education. Um, unless there are any questions about that, we did uh, provide you with the uh, property closing statement so that we can be very transparent about that. No comments or questions. Uh, one other thing that we talked about, and I asked our folks to pull this together, uh, we've had a number of questions about uh, uh, the uh, Booth project and, uh, you know, I guess there's, I don't know, 15 or 20 questions here. We've tried to be able to put that in one place, one document, and provide that. We've pushed that out uh, to the board, of course, to our community, through our social media. Hopefully that was helpful. And uh, if there are other questions that people want to know, certainly uh, all they have to do is give us a, a, send us an email or ask that, and uh, we'll get it to the right people so we can answer those questions for you. Uh, last thing on the superintendent's report, um, is that we need to give you an update on the FY20 budget development process. Mr. Gray is going to do that very quickly. This is part of our budget calendar, and uh, we're moving through that. Uh, it's hard to believe we're already springing forward and in March. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barrow. Um, you got, I'm sure the board's had a chance to look at this, so I'll just kind of hit the highlights. Page one is on the revenues. Um, at the top, we're taking a guess at what our QBE earnings would be, about $134 million. Um, that's uh, assuming the teacher salary increase, which would be $202,775 for each certified person, uh, would go in and be covered by about 75% from the state based on the way the formula works for us in our district. So that's, at this point, it's just a guess. But <clears throat> we did uh, receive confirmation from uh, DOE that the way that uh, it is presented by the legislature and what the proposal is at this point is each certified position would get that amount no matter what step they on. So every single step on the teacher salary scale would be raised a flat amount. So 
Um, it's a little bit different than normally doing a COLA percentage. Um, the other positions uh, that they are including would be a 2% COLA. Um, then um, look at continuing on revenues, you see uh, right below that is the uh, local five mil share. Just want to point out that again is a estimate as well. Our, our local five mil share will go up considerably next year. Uh, we're just going to have to start paying for that rising digest a couple of years ago. Um, in the middle you have the local revenues and we're seeing some slight increases. Um, we're just assuming at this point there's no digest um, increase as a starting point, uh, but 100% digest would uh, bring about $97 million. Um, on the second, oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask you a question? Just go back yes. a little bit. Uh, you talk about the governor, the legislature um, approving um, flat rate increases and then a 2% COLA. Um, I, my guess is they're not going to fully fund that. And so will that be half us, half them, or something? Correct. Um, they um, so it, they will. Do think the half unfunded mandate, perhaps? Right, yes. Um, so what they'll do is they'll raise the state teacher salary that flat amount and then their funding formula is based on that base level. Um, so it's, it won't we'll include any adjustments for T&E in that when they do that. So any adjustments for that we will um, be picking up most of that difference. So for us it ends up being about um, a 50-50 split right now on whatever you know the, the cost is, what the um, what we end up having to fund ourselves, but you're correct that even though they may have a 2% full amount, depending on what our local 5 mil share is and what positions we choose and what step that person's on, all those factor into whether how much that they're funding. Okay. Any other questions it, it on the record? It doesn't cover the whole <laughs> expense. <laughs> yeah. 100% yeah, right. correct. Okay. Um, and one thing to note on that is uh, the state does not cover any, any uh, anything for Social Security. Yeah. Um, we pick all that up since we the district chose that option several years ago. On the second page is just kind of a, a rough draft of the expenses, starting with the base current staffing at the top. Uh, if we do step increases for employees, um, the increase in TRS, and then, of course, that certified amount um, uh, for the teachers. Uh, and then a 2% COLA for all the classified employees. Um, also, we've already looked at some allotment increases. That's in the middle there for certified staff, about 14.5 positions. For classified staff, 19.5. Uh, so all those additions add up to about $10.5 million. Um, in the operating section, we're still working on that. It's a kind of in development, but starting with the base amount where we're at cur uh, currently. So that would um, put our budget up to $223 million next year. And based on the current revenues, which, you know, not really sure what the state's going to do um, as far as the, the total funding, what that is, and what the digest would do, um, uh, this is where we'd be. So I didn't know if there's any comments or questions. We're starting to work with all the departments on their operating budgets as well and starting to go through all the additional requests that might come from either schools or departments for positions or position changes. Help me out with the math. Are we going? Um, what's the percentage increase over last year? About going from two ten to two twenty three. Is that right? That's about five percent. I guess so. A little over ten. A little over ten million. Ten point five. So yeah, right at five percent. So basically, continue what we're doing. Now, I mean, this doesn't talk about any of these programs. I mean, any new things except for those. That That's correct, about. yes. But, you know, really uh, unclear on the on the revenue picture at this point, you know, with not knowing what the digest is or what the state final number is. So. Well, and we only get to know some of those things. Right. We have to Until after we start uh, paying people for right. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, Holloway, Are you ready to move the action yeah, items? Yep. Okay, I've the JC Booth. I know the board had requested that we uh, place this item on the agenda to consider for action. Uh, basically, uh, what we've done in looking at, um, and, and I won't go back over the entire history, but we had five options. We've narrowed it down to two. And in essence, what we're talking about is 
constructing a new middle school on the stagecoach property, which is the new property that the board owns, uh, or renovating and new construction on the current booth site there on Peachtree Parkway. And I know there was one uh, question I don't know if we fully answered, and I just want to address that. This is, I don't, I don't view this uh, as a brand new school. This is more of a replacement school for a school uh, that is still in our inventory. It's not going to go away. Uh, I, I certainly think that it can be repurposed, but it's not meeting the needs of our, our uh, students today. They're, we've outgrown the core, and we'd like to be able to take a look at that uh, as a potential either through the renovation and or the building of new. Uh, based on my uh, conversations with the board uh, and you know, hearing your conversations, I think uh, we're at a point where we're ready to recommend the option two, which is the new middle school on the stagecoach property. Uh, certainly uh, put that at the, uh, for the board to converse. And, 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 and for clarity, this doesn't include Tyrone. No, sir, it does not. And, and I want to uh, offer a little more clarity about that. We've tried to be all-encompassing and answer questions as they come. Uh, there will be other decisions that we can make. What we've been doing is talking about a lot of things, and as questions have come up, we've tried to answer those questions uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, but we, uh, we can refocus uh, after we're able to uh, make a decision about what's going to happen at Booth. Um, Tyrone's a possibility, but that's down the road. What we would do with the, uh, the old Booth is questions that we'll have to answer down the road. The thing that we're talking about today is building a new school, uh, a new construction uh, for a middle school on the stagecoach property. That's the recommendation that we have uh, for the board based on your conversation. Well, Dr. Bear, I appreciate your comments because in the past we've uh, made a lot of decisions kind of compartmentalized. Yeah. And I appreciate your effort to make a more holistic decision. I think that's the better decision. Yes, sir. And, and more we, holistically we, in terms of a school system, a county, and yes, sir. even statewide. And I think I think people have questions and they want to know why. And I think we ought to, we should be able to answer most of those. And um, um, I, I think the Q and A went uh, a long way in trying to address a lot of those. Um, and you know, we've been talking about this really for months. Uh, it's not just something that's brand new. I think we've gathered all of the relevant data to help make an informed decision. And I mean, I guess we don't have any motion or anything at the moment, but you know, uh, my understanding, I mean, we're moving forward with this option, but yes. until we actually have plans and know how much it's going to cost and authorize construction. That that nothing, is nothing. Nothing is. Ha we're no, sir. Moving that, in this direction. One hundred percent correct. All we're doing is asking to be able to go out and begin to design um, and to put out RFPs and and to get bids. Uh, ultimately, we'll bring all of that back to the board for your final approval, depending upon which construction model we decide to go with, whether it's design bid build or whether it's construction management process ultimately we need to be able to bring you a better number what we have is purely based on projections from our architect based on uh, square footage and um, so what you're doing is giving us direction that we want to go ahead and design this facility uh, look at what it's going to cost us put out the bids or uh, find out a closer cost and then ultimately that will be brought back to the board for your approval or, or not at that point. But so, we, so what's your recommendation today just to um, proceed as if we're going to build a new middle school but then we can put the brakes on later if we don't like the uh, Ultimately that's, uh, that, that's the authority that the board has. We can't do anything else with where we are. I think as a staff we've done everything that we could do to bring you the information. Uh, so if we want to go further um, and, and, and the direction's helpful because now you know you don't have to bid out renovations. That, that's right. We can push that off of the table at this point in time and, and clarify that because there, it's a capacity issue. We, we can't, I, I think we've juggled 
two options as long as we can, and now we need to narrow it down to to get better numbers and, and to be able to give you something that... But if we get construction prices that are way out of line with what we've estimated, we always revert back. Uh, then we'd have to go back all over again and start the process <laughs> again. But yes, sir, absolutely, well, that's what I we could do. I can't imagine that happening. But. Uh, yeah. So I guess we need a motion to yes. make a motion to move forward with uh, the construction, the next steps in the construction of a new middle school on the stagecoach road. Correct. But not a replacement for booth on the stagecoach road property. Is that yes? the right kind of motion? Yes, I think so. So moved. <laughs> a second, it doesn't matter. Second. All in favor? Five zero. Five zero. Yeah, a little discussion that I just wanted to uh, just reiterate where we've been is uh, sorry, <laughs> did that before the vote. But uh, I, I guess the premises that I've bought into that I think are true is that Booth needs to be renovated because it's old <laughs> and uh, it's insufficient or inconvenient for our current uh, practices. And another assumption that I've made and believe is true is the gym, the cafe are insufficient for our We've current practices. That core part. And, um, and then another assumption that I've made, <laughs> and I hope it's true, is that the renovating versus building is getting pretty similar in cost. And... Um, and then the, 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 uh, the last premise that I've made, that I'm, I'm not sure if this one is true, that we've outgrown the facility because we've had more kids there before, but maybe it's our practices have changed, and that's why we, we've outgrown the facility. But um, so, so there, there's a lot of assumptions there that, that I, I, I believe are true, but um, you know, unprovable assumptions that, uh, that we're basing that decision on. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, next uh, information items. Yes, sir. We have uh, several pieces of information. Uh, I won't go through all of them. I, I do want to point out that the state audit, you know, our, our system does actually an independent audit. You had that report earlier this year. Uh, we also have the state conduct an audit, which is a requirement. Uh, again, both audits have proven to be clean. We're very proud of our physical management and, and uh, again, kudos to Mr. Gray and uh, all of his staff for uh, keeping us on track. And then you had the exceptional children's service lead teacher. Uh, that's just uh, a uh, job description of okay. resources that we're trying to realign and shift and not spend more money, but take some of our existing resources and realign that. Um, we do, I, I wanted to mention one other thing that's not uh, is item D, the intergovernmental agreement. Uh, it's a fueling site. We're at, we've been asked by the county to allow them to use our fueling station down at our transportation department. They're paying the full freight for that. They pay for their fuel. It's just uh, geographically it's better for their vehicles to fill up on that end instead of, I think ultimately it saves the county taxpayers some money and it makes good sense, and we work together collaboratively. I, I think it will be a good thing. But the board does have to approve that. You have the intergovernmental agreement that has been viewed by both the county attorney and the board's attorney. Uh, so we're ready to pull that over is, on the agenda if y'all are okay with that. Is everyone okay with that going over to the consent agenda yep. for next meeting? Okay. Got that. Yep. Um, I, I had a question about the uh, policy, the competitive air scholastic activities. Yes, sir. And uh, yesterday or the day before, I was reading an article about something the legislature was doing to call it the Tebow Law. Yes. Is, is this a reaction to that? Or is this related to that at all? Or? No, I, I think that, that it'll be interesting to see. What I understand is is that the Senate has approved that portion. It goes to the House. And basically what Dr. March was talking about, if you are not aware, is that yeah. uh, if we have uh, – Individuals that are homeschooled, uh, they would have an opportunity to participate in an athletic program within their zoned attendance area, um, and that's yet to be passed by the House. Um, there, we'll see how that works. But this is this is uh, something that we needed to do just to update to give us a little more flexibility within our policy. Um, uh, we'll see where that goes. I'm sure 
that we'll have to work with. I spoke with the executive director of GHSA actually Friday night at the basketball game. We talked about this, and he said there's going to have to be some policy shifts both at the state and the local level. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. So then the addition on the bottom, the addition on the bottom here is because middle school is not covered by GHSA. That is correct. It is not, and um, we try to follow those policies and procedures pretty much like GHSA does. But that helps give us a little bit more cover if we've got um, associations of middle schools that are doing something that we're not comfortable with, or maybe we want to support or offer a suggestion. So that's what that does. That's all of the um, uh, information items. We do have need for executive session uh, to discuss two items, uh, both property, and we also need to address the uh, school, safety school safety plan. Yes, sir. So those two things uh, for executive session. So uh, a motion to move to executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor. All right. You need a motion to return from executive so session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Any recommendations from executive session? No, sir. No recommendations at this time. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you.